Uh, hey folks, thanks a lot for coming into the session, the last uh, session for the day. Uh, thank you for choosing Graph as the final one you attend. Um, so my name is Mel Fernando. I'm a product manager in the Microsoft Entra team. I'm a customer experience product manager from Melbourne, Australia. I work with a lot of the customers in Australia. Um, but as part of my the way our team is structured, um, we also work a little bit with the features. And uh, in my team, we all align to different features. Uh, I picked Graph and Graph PowerShell. So I work closely with the feature PMs for Graph PowerShell. And we have sort of two PMs who would have loved to be here, but uh, they are not. So that's Carol, who's from the Microsoft Graph team. She owns Graph PowerShell. And there's Steve um, Uthingi as well. And he owns the Entra side of Graph PowerShell, which is part of my org where we look at just um, mainly the Entra experience. So today's one will be a little bit tilted towards Entra, but that's one that almost everyone needs to use, which is users, groups, and all of that. So it's related to that. Um, yep, so I want to thank all the sponsors who made it possible um, to have all of these lovely sessions and the four great four days we've had, uh, and for Microsoft for sponsoring me to come in here, uh, all the way from Melbourne to share about PowerShell. Cool, so I'll just start from the basics, assuming you don't know much about Graph PowerShell for all of those who are completely new, um, and then go into some of the other areas that you would find useful. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Graph PowerShell is basically, the Graph PowerShell SDK is a wrapper over the Microsoft Graph API. So you have this REST endpoint that uh, is sort of the facade or the front end for all of the APIs that come uh, behind Microsoft 365. This is Teams, SharePoint, um, Sway, Loop, even the new Copilot um, capabilities, they're all front-ended with Graph. And before we had Microsoft Graph, uh, you used to have different APIs. So SharePoint had its own API, it still does. Exchange had its own API. You would do an auth with each different uh, API and the tokens didn't work with each other. You had to do a lot of massaging to you know, have one sign-in and then be able to use it across different products. So Graph API sort of simplified all of that. And the Graph API is used by a lot of users, uh, Microsoft and non-Microsoft ISVs building their products on top, of the, on top of the Microsoft platform. So we have different libraries for each sort of language and Graph PowerShell is one of those, right? So we have Python, various other CLI platforms. Um, PowerShell is one of those. So the way uh, it's been implemented is there is sort of like a monthly fortnightly release. Every two weeks they try to have release out uh, with all of the new REST APIs uh, being auto-generated into commandlets that you can use. Um, so we use AutoRest, uh, which is a PowerShell framework that's been built to sort of do this for Azure PowerShell as well, and we use that for Graph PowerShell, right? So there will be a bit of a theme with uh, things related to AutoRest, but that's how it's done. Um, all of this is done built in the open, so it's open source. The Graph PowerShell uh, team that builds and maintains the modules uh, they're all on GitHub. The issue tracking system is all on GitHub. Uh, so it's it's completely open. Compared to like, if you're on Entra team, we have our own internal repository with bugs and things, which you will never see because those are all internally built and it's, uh, it's an internal repository. The beauty of this is you can see the issues, you can raise issues, and you can have the person who's, you know, responsible for it, uh, giving responses and, you know, they, they address those issues or, uh, leave it open. So it's a lot more transparent um, and see-through and it's a really good resource for you to go in and search and find out does it really work this way and have someone help help you out, right? So that's, that's sort of one of the powerful things um, with the open source model. Right, so just to give you sort of some context, um, basically what Graph API does is you have the REST API, you pass in different parameters, the Graph PowerShell module gives you a PowerShell commandlet, command that you can use with um, the different parameters that you can pass in. So they're broken out. So you don't need to manually be you know, combining the strings and passing them and uh, sending them and so on. So this is where you say, get me all the users who are guests. You can just use the hyphen filter and, uh, and call that and it'll return the list of use objects. Okay, so just to walk you through the experience for those who are completely new to Graph PowerShell, 
Um, to do something like creating a new group, you would say new MG group, and you'd say, give me this, here's a display name, whether it's mail enabled or not, and you pass in those parameters. They support switch parameters as well. Um, and then you have that converted to REST API, and you can create a new object that way. Um, updating an object is again fairly sort of straightforward. Similar way, you say update, and you pass in the name of the object you want to do. So the pattern becomes really easy to follow, like users, groups, um, and various other uh, objects, you follow the same format. Right, how many of you have seen or written code like this? This is uh, a lot to do with authentication, right? To get, uh, sorry, not authentication, this is um, to, when you call the users, you are going to get a list of uh, users back, and then the first API call only returns like the first 100 users. So if you have a large org with more than 100 users, you need to page through all those results. Um, and so if, you, if you're used to working with Graph REST API, this is something you'd need to do, right? You write a loop, and then you say, okay, here's the next link, and you do that. So I saw a few hands, some of you might have scripts that do all of this, right? Um, now, Drake says, don't do that. <laughs> Right, <laughs> because what you can be doing instead is just writing this one command saying get mg user, and you say hyphen all. Uh, and the graph SDK has all of the code inside to page through those results and get you the complete assembled list of user objects in one go. Right, so there are lots of things that Graph PowerShell does for you where it's a lot more straightforward, lot simpler code that you would write uh, when you do uh, things like this. Right, uh, so the next one is I'm going to talk a little bit about authenticating with Graph PowerShell because uh, it's a thing that has a lot of people get stumped and um, I see a lot of code, blogs, uh, even sometimes blogs by MVPs who are maybe not security MVPs, they are like you know Teams or SharePoint, something else, and they just um, write some of these codes and share them. And you'll find even like, even this in 2024, someone writing code like this. Um, so this, sort of code, right? They, you pass in the client ID, the secret, uh, you call the auth uh, token endpoint, so that's the enter ID endpoint for doing the sign-in. It gives you a token, then they inject that token into the header and they send it off, right? So this is something that you'll see quite a lot. And if you search, and lots of beginners will see it, and then they go copy and paste that code, put that in, and okay, you've got the auth and um, you do that. Now you should, as someone from the intra team, uh, what we really want to call out is, please, please don't do that, right? So why you should not write any authenticating code, authentication related code in your scripts is, there are lots of issues with that, right? So when you get this token, the token that you get, this access token, it might work, right? And everything will be fine, but suddenly you might say, you're trying to get all your users, uh, or you get forgetting all the apps or service principles in your code, your script runs for more than an hour, then suddenly you get an error because the access token that you get is valid only for one hour. And then you need to uh, get a new token and that's a different endpoint you need to call and you need to send another refresh token. So you need to know all of these things about how token and OAuth works. Now your script will be a lot of authentication related code compared to your actual business logic of like what it is that you're trying to do, right? So uh, the token will need to be refreshed. So some people say, okay, so if that's the issue, let me increase the token lifetime. And then they go find searching for documentation on increasing the token lifetime. We've made it very hard to do because it's a really, it's a security issue to increase token lifetime. Um, so if you go to the docs, it'll be a bit cryptic uh, because while it is possible, we don't want you to do it. So for example, for graph, if you increase the token timeout, if you need to do that, you increase it for all of graph, for everything. And that give, means attackers, if they get an access token, they get more time to you know, get into all of the content in your tenant, which is something you really don't want to be messing around with the default token lifetimes. It's an industry standard, and there are other things um, involved in there, right? So don't try to change the token lifetime policies. Most of the time with conditional access, the, the admin might put in rules to say, okay, I'm going to block device code because we found people being fished and they're signing into a page and giving away their token. So we're going to block device code flow um, or we're going to reduce the sign-in. We don't want it to be one hour, we want to reduce it to half an hour. 
So maybe someone signing into a VPN or whatever. So the admins can define things that can affect the token lifetime. So your assumption that it would work for one hour, that existing as a token, it you know it um, might become invalid. I don't know why code is updating. Uh, and then we have other features like continuous access evaluation. There's so many other things we build uh, related to auth, and your code will need to be able should be able to handle all of that. So the best code that you can write is your PowerShell script having no authentication code, right? You just delegate all of that to somebody else and your code will become a lot more simpler. You don't need to worry about tokens, you don't need to write any of that. Um, you just rely on the existing one. So I, I write a few modules like the Entra exporter um, and like Maester and some of the other modules. We just delegate, there's zero auth related code in those modules because we just delegate it, which is what I'm going to share to you about, right? So this is, code is a bit too small to see, but um, this is someone, this is again, a recent code example I found uh, on Git, where they're doing a device code flow. And you can see, right, there's a lot of magic strings in here. They're doing this grant type. These are all OAuth, open, OpenID Connect standards based things that you need to do when you're doing an auth code token. And so they're doing a device code flow. Um, where you just you know get a code, you go to login page, put in the code, and you sign in. Attackers use it a lot because they can fish someone, they can get the sign in started in their local desktop, then send a phishing link, get the person to fill in, or maybe over the phone, tell them to uh, do a login uh, and put in a code and sign in, and suddenly they have a session which they can now use right uh, by phishing that user. So yeah, so this is a device code flow example. And if your admin sort of applies a conditional access policy, then this is the message your script will start to see. It says your admin has sort of blocked device code flow. Now, if you wrote this script, you'll have to come in back and try to change all these different strings to get the right thing working. But if you use the graph SDK, um, the graph partial SDK, you said connect MG graph. Previously, you had used device code flow. And if you want to connect without code flow, you want to just do interactive auth, all your fix is basically just to say connect MG graph. Then it does an interactive auth. And, and then we have a lot of um, different um, parameters. So let me just bring this up, right? So if I go to the uh, connect MG graph, I don't know if that's big enough to see, maybe I might zoom in. So if you go in here, you can see we have all these different sort of auth methods and I'll show it in the next slide as well. So if you want to do interactive, this is how we do it. You want to do device code flow, this is the example. You want to use your own access token. Um, you want to use your own application instead of the out of the box graph application. Um, sometimes security for uh, conscious orgs would want to have different permissions for graph being granted to different teams. So then they would create custom apps so you can do that uh, you can use credentials, certs, app-only access where there is no user involved. Um, it's like a daemon service running. You can do that. Uh, client secret. You can use managed identity. Um, and if you're working with government and different clouds, you can do that as well. And I'll just cover that. So we have all these different ways of connecting. They're all built in. Why would you not use that, right? Now, even at Microsoft, uh, we announced this Secure Future initiative uh, recently and we shared an update as well. So even internally, not everyone was standardized on using a, sa a same way of doing this. And uh, at Microsoft, we had this thing called the Microsoft Authentication Library, which is what we build and we give to all developers. Um, and we have libraries for each platform, right? Whether it's .NET, uh, JavaScript, Java, Python, Node, uh, React, there's an MCL library for every platform for all of the devs. Um, and these are written by people whose day job is to understand the OpenID Connect standard and, and just write the auth code. Like, that's all they do, right? And as someone who's writing just a script, you'll never be able to match to the level of what they are doing or the knowledge they have, right? And they keep it up to date. They fix security issues. As the standards evolve, they update it. Um, so there's no reason for you to like sort of spend time Writing, even though the initial script looks really simple and you can do that and get your token going, um, that's a lot that happens under the hood, especially when it comes to multiple platforms. Like on Windows, you wanted to use 
the option of using the existing token the user has, they're signed in. Um, so it can basically reuse those tokens as well. So you don't even need to show a prompt, it can do a single sign on. So even at Microsoft, we've had issues with like even our first party apps. And uh, if you see in this secure, uh, future initiatives, one of the things, uh, three things that are called out as to what Microsoft is doing to become more secure is to use um, MCL or there's an internal version of MCL that we use, uh, but they even call out, right? MCL being used in all of Microsoft's applications, first party apps, mm -hmm. right? So that's something we are aligning towards as well. And for you in PowerShell world, using Graph PowerShell or Azure PowerShell, it behind the scenes uses the same library, you get all of those benefits of doing that, right? So it, this is all to say, don't write any auth code and stressing that importance of that. Yeah, and, and just as I covered, right, it handles uh, the multi-cloud scenarios. If you're writing a script or a module that might be used in maybe GovCloud or in different other clouds, there are different endpoints you need to hit and Graph Connect takes care of all of that, right? They just pass in another parameter and your script. So the, the less authentication script you have in your code, the more resilient your script is. Like you don't need to, if they say, I want to do, does it work with China or the other Gov clouds? You say, yeah, because you're using the graph module to do the sign in and everything would just work. All right, so moving on to lots of bits of tips and tricks. Um, graph X-Ray is a, a Chrome browser extension that I built with a team you know, like during a hackathon. Um, and basically what it does is it lets you do things in the UI in the admin portal, you know, stuff that you're used to doing, like creating a, a new user or a new group, and be able to generate the graph PowerShell commands for that, right? So uh, this is to just get you, get started on like how you can do it. So I'll give you a quick example. Let's start with filtering, right? When you're writing filtering code, you need to know, you know, how to filter and, and you know, write out the graph query for the filter, um, an easier way, is uh, this, right? So you install the Chrome ex extension. Uh, there's one for Chrome and Edge as well called Graph X-Ray. Uh, put it on, then you'll see this Graph X-Ray um, tab in the dev tools. Now you can go into the UI and do whatever you want, right? You can say, okay, show me all the, uh, the groups that are M365 groups, and you can see it generates the code for running a Graph PowerShell for that. So let's say, I want to see all the users who are created in the cloud. So I do that and you can see it creates the graph PowerShell commandlet version of it. Um, and I'll copy it out into VS Code to just show how it looks. Uh, and you can see the filter command, right? See it says filter on-prem sync enabled is true. Uh, get me all the users uh, where the groups object is uh, unified. Now, if you had to write it yourself, it would have taken some time, right? Like you were able to do this in in a few seconds. Now, a quick thing to note is it's not 100% won't give you everything, so you, you will need to do some additional things. So for this particular method, you need to pass something called consistency level. Uh, so the generated code that didn't have that, you just need to massage the result. So it's not 100% copy and paste and everything runs. What we do in that Chrome extension is we listen to the graph API calls that are happening and then use that to generate the code, right? But the neat thing here is uh, like, would you have ever figured out on-prem sync enabled equals true was the feature to look for cloud sync. So uh, it's a way to do what you have in the UI and then get to the, the commandlet, right? Uh, here's one for creating. So what it does is it uses the, the admin portals that have using graph, X -ray, graph API. Not all of them use the public graph API, some of them use internal API. So for example, Entra, if you go to the apps portal and do things in the apps blade, they don't use the, you know, the public graph API, they use some internal graph API, so you won't get the translation for that. So Graph X-Ray like tries to do its best with the apps that uh, do support it. Intune is really good. The Intune entire portal is using public graph APIs. Um, so you can use it with almost any uh, place where the graph is used. So here I'm going into Intune, I'm going to create a device restriction. Um, so I'm just going to do all of this in the wizard and I'll generate the PowerShell commandlet for that, right? So this is about creating um, a, a device restriction where let's say 
I want to say cloud storage, you know, disable iCloud backups, right? So I create a device restriction like that and I hit save. So you, you do need to hit save for the graph API call to be made. And then it generates the graph call uh, and it calls the graph PowerShell SDK for that, right? And you can now copy that in, um, put it in your VS code. With this one, uh, luckily you didn't need to do much massaging with the outputs. I just putting in a different character because I already saved an object, so you'll have duplicate names. Um, so I'm just copying that out. You can see the parameter that it set. Um, and I, I run that command and that's it. So it created the um, graph object using the graph partial stick. So if I do a refresh, uh, now you'll be able to see the one that I just created is there, right? So graph X-ray is just a, a sort of a way to boost you into what the API call should be. Yes. Yes. So it, it uses whatever the ape, whatever the portal is calling. So if it was calling the beta endpoint, then it generates the same. So um, if you see this, uh, it's small c, but the graph API call used by the portal is the beta endpoint. So the generated code is using the same thing. So it's whatever was running, and it can be not even this, right? If you are an ISP and you are you have your own Teams app, et cetera, that's calling graph, you can, because it's a Chrome extension, you can open Teams in the browser and be able to see what's happening there as well and, you know, take the partial version of the command. Yes. This uh, does it doesn't work with US government. Okay, so it's, it's a filtering thing. So I, that's a good feature request <laughs> to add. Um, so I'll just show you a sort of behind the scenes what happened. Sorry, another question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It depends on the team that's writing the portal, that's building the front end portal. So sometimes maybe they added new features with that, which are not in V1 yet. And so they would call that. And because it's their own, so it's the same team usually that's writing the endpoint and writing the UI for it as well. So they can support themselves, but usually we say like avoid using the beta endpoint. Yeah. So yeah, so a bit of a backstory and showing you how things happen behind the scenes. Um, so I, the way I started this is, as with all of you, right, I, I, I figured out that if I do things in the UI and see what's happening behind using Fiddler or using the network tools, I could see the actual graph API. But then when it generated, usually like there'll be a bunch of code that's generated or it's doing a batch call and the actual call is embedded within that. Um, so this is how I used to do before, right? I would go in there, copy that out, then put that into, which you can still uh, do today, right? There are that, there's nothing stopping you doing that. Um, and then you can see what, what's happening behind the scenes because they're just calling the graph API themselves. And I would copy this and then figure out what is the PowerShell way to call this and, um, and then write all that code. So then I thought there has to be a better way to do this, like just filter and show me only the graph calls. Um, there's also a copy as PowerShell in DevTools, so you can put that. But even with that, if you paste that in, you'll see it's like, really verbose and they do a lot of the encoding and different things. So it just gives you the raw PowerShell um, commands for that. Um, and sometimes like those don't work even the way it passes things, right? So we started a way to, initially we just wanted to show the graph calls and, um, and then we realized that uh, if you look at, um, yeah, let me open the source code and show you, right? So all of this is public if you go to my uh, repository, there's a graph extra repository, um, and you can get this, you can, you know, put in, so for example, getting US GUB support, there's actually a filter that says only if it's graph.microsoft.com, show the values, so we can add in the other code. So if you see this, it's using Graph Explorer and API to do the translation. So it sends the rest calls that it's seeing, and that converts it. So if you use Graph Explorer, you may or may not have noticed there's a code snippets tab where you can actually call in any API and see the PowerShell version of that. So this is using that API. So all we did with the plugin is behind the scenes, we are calling that API, sending the code, and then we are saying, okay, if it's a graph.microsoft.com, then we filter, and it supports different languages. Um, so we then 
get the conversion done in the back end to the graph PowerShell version of the command. Right, so we've been trying to get this into the into PowerShell itself, into the portal, in the Entra portal. Um, but yeah, we there are lots of other priorities, so hopefully at some time it might become available. All right, so that's enough about Graph X-Ray. I'm going to give you some things that usually frustrate people about Graph, and it's to sort of teach you how things work behind the scenes, so you'll be a little bit more uh, aware of you know what to do and what not to do. So when you take any graph object, there are different types of properties. And one key distinction is there are two types of properties there. One is native properties that are part of the object itself, right? Like first name, last name, and things like assign licenses are properties of the object. And then you have something called a navigation property. Or if you see the docs, they're actually called relationship, right? So this is manager, like direct owner, like collection of others. So it's sort of like, you know, if you take a database, you have relationship diagram, it's sort of those relationships there. But just by looking at the objects, you would, if you just look at the raw objects, you wouldn't realize, you know, what is what. And you'll get stumped by some things work one way and other things work another way and why uh, it leads to a lot of frustration. So if you open up, there's something called the graph metadata. Um, they, we use this open API XML and you can see it has um, this definition. If you open it up, there's a URL if you hit, it's there in the graph docs. Uh, it will have this whole, all of graph API is in one XML file. All these definitions are there. And we basically generate the PowerShell commandlets, et cetera, out of this XML, right? It's an open API standard um, where you have things like, you know, what is the data type, uh, what's the collection. So you can see assign licenses is a collection of, uh, a, objects called assign licenses. And if you see manager, it's a directory object. It's like one object that it refers to. Direct reports is a collection of a directory object. And that's so you have this sort of uh, relationship. And if you go to the Microsoft Docs, um, it's not always apparent, but uh, if I go, so for example, I opened up the user object. Uh, if you go to the uh, graph API docs, you have all these methods and so on, right? So right at the top, you will see it says properties and relationships. So properties are basically things that are part and they're stored in the object itself. So it has an impact when you come to doing filtering and so on. So you can see with each object we say, okay, this one supports filtering and these are the properties. So it's not universal when you're trying to query and search. Um, and all of this is documented. Like for example, this um, country provi consent provider, there are only a few properties, whereas for country you have, you know, starts with and all of these things are there. So you need to know which one supports what, because if you try to do a, like a starts with, with a parameter that doesn't support it, you will get an error. Sometimes it's cryptic, sometimes it's clearly telling you it doesn't support it. Um, so you can avoid a lot of frustration by, uh, by looking, by knowing where to go and look, right? So for every method, you will need to go, but the problem is when you're working in PowerShell, there's no direct link to the API yet. And this is one of the things that's on the later slide. They, we are working on a fix where from PowerShell docs, we'll have a link back to the graph API itself where you can see all this information and it'll sort of help you come quickly. So you have these properties, you have relationships. So you can see relationships are what I call the navigation properties. So this is where you have all the other objects and like that impacts what you can do and we'll look into that, right? So one big rule is you cannot use uh, filter properties with relationships. You can use them only with um, the properties that are stored in the object, right? So an example is better, right? So if you are doing a get MG user, assign licenses, now you know assign licenses is, an, is a property of the user object itself. So there you can do a filter and you can do a query like this. So get me all the things where assign license count is not zero um, and you can get those values. But uh, if you try to do that with direct reports, it won't work um, because that's a, a relationship or a navigation property, right? So this sort of, I'm hoping will help you understand what's happening behind the scenes and help you demystify. There are some objects that do support count and like you can do that. So 
hopefully that's clear like when you look at the now the docs make a little bit more sense right you have properties and relationships and when you're writing your queries and trying to query because end of the day when you write powershell half of the scripts we write are creating reports right because out of the box doesn't have the report that you need and you're trying to build a report and filtering is like a neat way to get these out okay so all good um, and then we have um, this, right? So this is the example where you run it, it doesn't work. Uh, right, so when it comes to getting or retrieving these objects, there are two parameters you would use, select and expand. So usually for properties, you would use the select. When it's a, um, a relationship and you want to get, say for example, the user and the devices that they own, right? You want to create a report of what are the devices that are registered under a person's name. So they own devices registered, there are different collections. So you can query and say, okay, get me the device and the user and the objects that they manage. Um, and you, you do, that way you reduce the number of calls. You don't have to do one for get user, another to get all the devices and then try to merge them together. In one call, you get the user and you can get their objects as well. Right. Um, so, for example, so quick quiz: If you want to get the licenses and the devices owned by a user, how would you write the command? So, you would say get mg user. And based on what we've learned so far, how would you do this? You would say select assign licenses, and for the relationship, you would say expand, and then you'd say own devices. So, before this, right? If you looked at it, you'll go like, what is what, what, why am I trying to do two different things? But now that you know that devices are a relationship, you will need to do an expand on them to get, right? Now, there are limitations with expand. You can only have one expand property. So if you want to get the managers as well in one call, that's not possible. It only supports like one expand uh, object. So you'll need to limit that. Um, so far, so good. but. Uh, there is a catch there as well, right? Uh, and this, I've seen people write code and it works fine and they've created reports. Sometimes your report might be incorrect because when you do an expand on, this is only on the intra directory objects, right? So which is, I had that list before, applications, users, service principles. When you do an expand, it only returns the first 20 and it doesn't give you any errors, right? So if you create a report of all the managers and the people they report under them, Right? You'll get a nice report, which you might think is all correct and valid, but anyone who's having more than 20 reports, you will only get 20 people in that list, right? And it wouldn't show any other. So maybe you already have scripts that do this and you just realize that you're not, maybe not reporting the right way, right? So um, that's something to be aware of. It's there in the docs in the FAQ. You wouldn't know it until you go in and <laughs> found that out, right? So. Uh, something to be aware of when you're working with these objects. So what you, the only, there is no way to get around it. The only way to get around it is to make another call, pass in the object that you are referencing and do a hyphen all, then it will get everyone. So if you want to get the direct reports of a person, uh, if your org has more than 20 people, people having more than 20 directly reporting to a person, then you would want to do that, do it this way, right? So you'll have to make multiple calls. You can't just get it in one call, right? So um, just be aware of some of these gotchas there. Um, so every graph relationship, right, has a built-in command. So that's the neat thing that's there in the graph SDK, which was not there before. So you don't need to write, you know, the filter and the expand, and you can skip all of that. And you can just say, like, for example, get mg group calendar, get mg group app role assignment, you pass in the group ID, and you get all that. So if you want to get like the members of a group, you can do get mg group member, pass in the group ID, you get all the members that way. So you don't need to write the expand and you know all of that yourself. So sim these are all, because they're all auto-generated, no one's writing them by hand, you actually have a lot more commands that you can use, right? So that's one of the plus sides of all this being auto-generated because no one's ever going to sit and write all these commands, right? And uh, this is the plus side of an auto-generated one. So you get that, all right? So every relationship, every object, <laughs> you have 
a command which is unthinkable if someone is handwriting all these things, right? Um, and your code will be like, you know, a lot easier. So yeah, when I talk about entra and the device objects, these are the uh, objects we are talking about because these are all code directory objects is like part of Azure AD. So when, when we first created Azure AD, these were the objects that were first there, part of that, that first set of things. Um, because you needed orgs, devices, service principles, and the, like we, I think the first version was out maybe 20 plus years ago when we first started moving to the cloud uh, with Exchange. So these are all there from that time. Right now, because of that, unlike OneDrive and like you know the uh, capabilities that you have with the other objects, there are some limitations with that, and that's why there are things you need to do special when it comes to these objects, right? So Graph API calls a REST directory service, but behind the scenes, what happens is the call for those objects that I just spoke about, they go into what we call the directory store. Like we have internal names, I'm not using internal names here, but we have this directory store, and now that's a global store. It was built for like highly performant, and it was like designed 20 years ago. That's what's still running. Um, and these are like geo-distributed, right? So when you, uh, when you do things like create a new user or a new object, they get created in one place and get replicated to multiple data centers. Uh, depending on uh, the region, we do even global, globally uh, distributed and we uh, do those writes across the board. And we do fancy things like if you're in the same geography and you make a call, even though there might be like a, a few milliseconds, like within a second, they get replicated across the globe. So they're built for high performance. But sometimes if you do a new object, like maybe create a new group and you try to add a new user, if you're not going back to that same place within that microsecond, your, your code is going to fail. So we do things like when you create a new object, the rest of the calls, if you're in the same country and running it, it gets created, um, it goes to the same uh, data center where you created the object. So to make sure that you're getting the same thing, right? So people who have used Terraform might have run into issues because sometimes Terraform scripts can be across, coming in from different locations, right? You create an object, it's trying to add a user to an object, and it's not there because that Terraform is calling in a different connection session in from a different location. So it might be hitting a different directory store where it's um, the object is not there. Uh, your PowerShell scripts, you don't need to even think about it. They all go back to the same session. As long as your script is running in the same geography, we look at different parameters, uh, your scripts will all continue working. But if you try to create an object in one country and your script next uh, GitHub action or the DevOps uh, action is running in a different country, you have different nodes, you might hit, come across these issues where you create something and it's not there in the other place. So it's a 20 year old thing. At that time, we didn't have all these fancy filters and so on. So a lot of these capabilities you didn't have before. You couldn't do a lot of the filtering. So we sort of put those things back in and added them. But at some point we realized like you needed to have a lot more functional capability. Like you wanted to get, um, say for example, a, a group and get all the members of a group, including the nested groups in one call. Right? It wasn't possible. We've now added that capability where you do one call, it can go into all of the nested groups and get you all the users, right? Uh, but you cannot do that using this endpoint because it's not structured in that way for us to be able to get that response for you. So what we built is to solve that problem, uh, we created a new index store and it's sort of, there's a sync happening between that index store and this new index store is a modern one which supports a lot of the newer capabilities to query various different things and get you the data. So when you're writing your queries with filter and you want to use some of those new capabilities, that's where when the call comes in, we don't know where it should go. So we use these headers that you need to send. So you need to say, uh, I want the consistency level eventual because it's not going to be 100% consistent because there's a sync happening, there's a latency. So just to, as you as a dev, so this was meant for developers, right? People building ISV applications and you know various things. When they create objects, they want the data to be there. But if you are doing reports or you are okay with some latency, then you can opt in to using this uh, newer query flow. But what you need to do is pass in some headers. 
to tell graph, send this request to this other endpoint, which can uh, do all this other filtering, right? Now, we are working on reducing the latency. So what we're trying to do is when a new object is created, we are also calling the other endpoint, which will, you know, update the cache without waiting for a sync. So this is all just to explain to you behind the scenes what happens so that when you are asked to do things like, hey, pass in this consistency level eventual and it just sounds like some magic spells you're putting in, right, <laughs> before, before I explain the things behind the scene. Um, so that's what's happening here. When you're trying to do some of the advanced queries, you will need to do this. So we have a page that lists all of these in the docs and they help you. Yes. Yes, so why it's not good to, and there have been, like Justin mentioned the other day as well, that we have threads, if you go to the bar, uh, graph PowerShell SDK in the issues, we have a huge thread going with uh, Justin and a few others in the community, like saying, why can't you just have this by default for all of the queries you know where you want it to include? Um, so the reason is we want the people who are calling this to be aware that you're going to get data that will not be accurate. now. It depends on your business rules and what you are building that if you are, if there's a latency, we don't return the object that you just created in the, in, a, in the step before the call you made here, then those objects might be missing, right? So that is the reason why it's not included by default. But you, the one valid argument is why two things? Like why couldn't I just send one thing? Why do I need this count variable true? So that they're addressing um, in a lot of the, methods as we work through them, we are dropping this requirement to do count variables. So you don't, you no longer need that part of it. You only need consistency level eventual. Right now, it's in a transition state. So some things, it's still there required, some it's not. And we're improving the messaging as well. So that's the, the reason. Is there yeah. any other values except eventual which should be passed to the particular? No, it's uh, only eventual right now. <laughs> The, yeah, so I'm, I'm not aware of the answer for that, but I can definitely find out um, whether we plan to add more things or why it's not a switch. It's mostly because it's a wrapper, UV use auto rest that generates it, so it's tied to that. And also backwards compatibility, like people have scripts already, we can't go back in and change. Yes. Eventually, yes, yeah. Yes. Just one switch, right? 100%. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because just remembering this, you know, for the first time you come across it, it's uh, not easy to remember. All right. So we are almost, are we out of time? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go through this quickly. I, um, uh, there's a lot more I wanted to cover, but this one is about directory objects. So you, there's an inheritance model happening in graph objects as well. So you have this base object type called directory object and you have application devices, they're all inheriting from that, right? Um, this is because there are various collections in um, Entra Azure AD where you can have a mix. So you can have a group that can have a mix of devices, users, service principles in them and they're not all the same object model, the hierarchy is different, right? So um, just, I have a few demos that I'll run through, hopefully time will be enough. Uh, but say if I want to do a group member of that particular group that I just showed you, right? It had user, a device, uh, and um, it had four different or three different types of objects. So if you do hyphen debug, which is another tip, is um, you can see what's happening behind the scenes with the any of the graph calls. So you can see the actual graph API call that's being made. And you can see for the return type, there's an OData type and it says graph user graph, uh, whether it's a device object or a service principle. So you get all of this metadata um, of what those objects are and, and you know, the values under uh, for each of them, right? So we just did one type, but you can see the properties also change. A device doesn't have the same properties as a group and um, a user doesn't, don't have the same properties. So you get, you will get mixed results. So when you're working with these, it's a little complicated to work with because 
not all the properties are the same and how do you pass them, right? So we had this get group member as and uh, you can then get the just only the users and it gives you the actual use object. The same thing you can do for group, you can do for device. So you have a specific method that you can call and it gives you only that particular. So it filters out and just gives you the objects that you need. So that's one way. If you're only interested in users in a group, you can do that. But if you use just the default one, it doesn't give you an object that's easily usable, right? You don't get the IntelliSense and auto completion. Yes, yeah. So the reason is it's all auto rest. So they're doing a consistency because if you go to the graph API and you say get mg user slash and you pass in the, you can pass in the type and say slash user, you pass in the data type, it gives you only the user objects. So basically this is just a translation of the rest API into, into this. They're trying to keep it consistent. So if you work there and uh, it gives you, but yeah, valid, um, feedback there. So if you want, let's say I want to write a, a loop that goes through all the objects within a group, right? And I want to display metadata, right? So I'm going to figure out, I'm going to show you how I figured this out, right? So if you do get mg group, you can see it doesn't return the user principal name because the object types are different, like a device doesn't have user principal, so it doesn't get included, right? So what I'm going to do is um, do a convert to JSON and I'm going to see what is the data type that's there? So you, you can do this yourself, right? You can go find the data type and then you can do a switch, right? And say there's an additional properties object, right? So this is how you can go behind the scenes and see what's happening. Um, so I can say, okay, I'll loop through this, I'll do a switch. There is this property called additional properties and then it has the actual data type. So I can say, okay, if it is a user, then you know this is how you can cast it. If it is a device, cast it this way, and you can then uh, figure out, you know, how you do that casting of those different objects. Um, yeah, so this is an example, right? So I just said, if it's the data type is user, then I can take that user type and I can display it. Now, that too is going to fail because the object that is there by default is a directory object, you know, the base class object, which is not the, the actual object that we needed. So it is not doing the cast. But there's an existing method that does the cast, right? Remember I said as user, as group. So if you call that, it gives you the full object. So how do we replicate that, right? We've done one graph call. How do we replicate that? Um, what you can do there is if you say, um, do the get type of the object, you can see the actual name of the class behind. So you can get IntelliSense working so that when you say dot, it will give you the actual properties that you can read from. So what you do is you do a casting in partial and you cast that object to the one that you want, right? And it gives you uh, then the property it gives you, if you, you saw that it gives you the intelligence, right? Now I run that, but then it doesn't work because I don't have the full reference to the assembly, right? So you need to do a using at the top or you'll need to put in the object. But how do you figure out what it is? It's a fixed one for all of them, but I just showed you the command to get the full name. Um, so you can just say graph.powershell.models and you can just copy that and use it. So I'm, in this demo, I just wanted to show you how you can work through this yourself and then try to figure it out. Um, and then you'll be able to get to the actual object, right? So you did one graph call, it returned lots of different objects. And then we figured out how to cast them into the actual object type that we need. And then you can access all of those properties. You get IntelliSense. So you can do like, you know, members, users, devices. Um, you can pull in all of those different things and you can access, you know, like properties like that, the server dot operating system, you do the dots and you get all of that information, right? So just a guide of how you know you work through this. I'll quickly run through the next few. These are like all short, quick tips. Um, if you might or might not know about this, but if you do a get help and a command name, if you do hyphen online, you get directly to the page for that command, right? So you don't need to go searching in graph in Google for that API, then clicking links. 
You can just do get help, you the name of the command, hyphen online. You just open up the page, you get all the permissions, right? So really powerful way to get to that. Um, the other one is when you do a convert to JSON, it gives you the full object, which is not easy to pass through. So um, you might return only three or four properties, right? But when you uh, do a convert to JSON, because it's using that PowerShell model, the c -sharp object model, it gives you a lot, like everything and lots of nulls in there, right? And it might not be very meaningful. Um, so Graph PowerShell has a dot two JSON string. Every Graph PowerShell object has a dot two JSON string method. So you can just use that, and that gives you just the the things that are there in the, the object that's been returned, right? So just another uh, tip to remember. This uh, other one is find mg graph command. If you didn't know that, you should know. If you do that, you can get, you know, what are the permissions I need to connect to get the resources? Uh, you can just say find mg graph, give the name of the command, uh, and in the permissions, you will see a list of the permissions that are needed. So you can pick the, the least privilege of that when you do the connect command. Um, similarly, like I did before with the uh, relationships, if you just want to get a count, there is one command for almost everything. You want to get the count of users, you want to get the count of uh, devices in your entire tenant, just one command, right? You don't need to do a filter and uh, do the dollar count and all those, uh, that example, you can just call that one command, you get that. Uh, you can even use filter with that count. So you can say, get me all the guests. So you do a filter on top of the count which uh, you can use, right? So simple commands. Um, again, count is there for everything. Any method call you call, you get a count. So you have all these <laughs> different commandlets for using. And the only reason is because it's auto-generated, you get all of these uh, things which are really easy. Now, while I told you not to use the invoke web method, um, there is a fallback method in graph PowerShell called invoke mg graph request. Sometimes the commandlet is not there because it's very new, or sometimes like I've used it because I needed to um, get all the users or devices in a tenant that had millions of objects, right? And these scripts sometimes take like eight hours, 20 hours, right? So you run it and then come back the next day, it's still running, getting all the values. So if there's some network connection, some interruptivity in between, you have to now start again and run it for another 24 hours. So in my graph samples, I did this example where you need to call yourself this invoke graph request, but it's still using the graph PowerShell module, but the sort of like the get out of jail thing where you can pass in whatever you want. And then I sort of, um, every time I get a page, I save the page link so that if it got interrupted, it can restart from there again. And so you don't need to you know wait hours. So there are instances where you might need to use invoke graph request, so that's an option that you have for doing things like that, right? So as much as possible, you can use existing commandlets, but you can also go back to using uh, graph request. It's better than doing your own token handling and you know passing those parameters in. Now this one, I have not finished it. I wanted to get it ready, but there is an ak.ms slash awesome graph ps. I've it's not complete yet, right? So I, I still need to do my homework, um, but I, I'll plan to have all of Graph PowerShell related links in that one GitHub repository. Uh, if you have any that you want to contribute, feel free to submit a PR and uh, we'll have all, all of that. Awesome, so thank you everyone. I hope you found all of this useful, uh, learned a little bit more about Graph PowerShell. Um, quick note about what's coming to Graph PowerShell uh, next. Finally, we are going to add piping support that's coming very soon. So you can do get mg user, pipe it to another object. PowerShell, we expected it to be there all the time, but it's not there, but that's coming and uh, there are a few other with docs updates that are coming through. Cool, awesome, thanks, uh, and we'll see you next time.